Hello students, today we are going to deal with a short story titled An Unfinished Story written by O. Henry. Let's begin with the introduction to the author. O. Henry was an American writer whose short stories are known for wit, wordplay and clever twist endings. He wrote nearly 600 short stories about life in America. Let's know in detail about him. He was born William Sidney Potter on 11th September 1862 in Greensboro, North Carolina. His father, Sidney Potter, was a medical doctor. When William was three, his mother died and he was raised by his grandmother and aunt. He left school at the age of 15 and then had a number of jobs, including a bank clerk. In 1896, he was accused of embezzlement. He absconded from the law to New Orleans and later fled to Honduras. When he learned that his wife was dying, he returned to the US and surrendered himself to the law. Although there has been much debate over his actual guilt, he was convicted of embezzling funds from the bank that employed him. He was sentenced to five years in jail. While in prison, he began writing short stories in order to support his young daughter, Margaret. His first published story was Whistling Dick's Christmas Talking, which appeared in 1899. He used a pseudonym Oliver Henry only once and then later changed it to his pen name as O. Henry. He didn't want his readers to know that he was writing from a jail. He then published 12 stories while he was still in prison. After serving for three years of the five-year sentence, he was released for his good behavior. He moved to New York City in 1902 and wrote a story a week for the New York world and also for other publishers. His first collection of short stories was Cabbages and Kings, which appeared in 1904. The next collection, The Four Million, which appeared in 1906, included his well-known short stories that he is very famous for, like The Gift of the Magi, The Skylight Room, The Green Door, etc. One of his last stories, The Ransom of Red Chief, of 1910 is perhaps the best known of his works. Some of his stories like Ruthless People were even made into films. In his lifetime, O. Henry was able to see the silent film adaptations of some of his stories, like The Sacrifice in 1909, Trying to Get It Stead and His Duty both in 1909. His success brought the attendant pressure and he suffered from alcohol addiction. His second marriage lasted only two years and his wife left him in 1909. He died of liver cirrhosis on June 5, 1910 in New York. O. Henry is credited for creation of the Cisco Kid whose character alludes to Robin Hood and Don Quixote. The Arizona Kid, which appeared in 1930, and The Cisco Kid of 1931 are among the best known adaptations of his works. The main plot of Unfinished Story deals with the past events of the speaker. He actually tries to recollect one of his dreams where he is being judged by God on the day of judgment for his actions on the earth. While there, he is asked by an angel if he belongs to a certain group of men waiting to be judged along with him. He was surprised and at that point, the story moves to the life of a girl named Dulcie. O. Henry clearly brings the story to the present from his dream, saying that it's not important to discuss the events of the dream at that point of time of the story. Now, Dulcie is a poor girl who works for $6 per week. That was quite a long time ago. And that's very little money, which leaves her often hungry. She's been asked on a date by a fairly rich guy 
called Piggy. It seems that he is in the habit of trapping poor girls. He takes undue advantage of their poverty by giving them food and such other things and expects them to sleep with him. Dulcie realizes this very late and refuses at the last minute to go out with him. But the story reveals that at some time later when she is more hungry, she does go out with him. Or maybe she might have gone. There is no clear indication whether she has really gone out or she doesn't. But he mentions that maybe if she had been more hungrier, she might have gone out with him. The story then returns to the dream where the narrator talks about the afterlife. The group of men the angel had asked about were rich businessmen who owned the places where girls like Dilsey worked. The men who paid them so little that they had to sleep with them to get food. The speaker in his defense says, he burnt down orphanages and killed a blind man for his pennies, but that he was not as bad as the men who paid the girls so little and are being judged on the day of judgment. The story is left here on an unfinished note, left to the reader's imagination as to think whether the narrator is really accused of any crime and if Dulcie had really gone out with Piggy on a date is left to the imagination of the readers. As we notice, the story is in the first person. The narrator tells us the story that he had a dream and what he saw in his dream and later shifts the story to Dulcie. So Dulcie, being the main character of the story, is a sales girl who believes in pipe dreams, gallantry and undefiled innocence and who illustrates the impossibility of making old world values compatible with the pressures of the new consumer society. On her very low wages, as mentioned earlier, it's just $6 per week. She can hardly make both ends meet. Yet, the superfluous things that she purchases, for example, the licorice drops, pineapple fritters, imitation lace collar, etc., and her consumption habits, she mentions Coney Island, window shopping, expensive Sunday breakfasts, and generous tips to the waiters when she go out for breakfast. All these make her a consumer of conspicuous waste and leisure. Despite being a victim of the labor market's blatant injustices, Dulcie's impulse to become an active consumer is stronger than the fulfillment of her most basic needs. She also takes raspberry jam, crackers and tea. That is what make her dinner. And since buying has become a deep-rooted instinct, her story does not need any telling. Only too well does the reader know that she will be unable sooner or later to resist the temptation of an evening with Piggy, the corrupt businessman. That is how the character of Dulcie is portrayed in the story. Now moving on to another important character in the story, that is Piggy. Mr. Wiggins is a rich businessman who takes the lives of the employees in his firm for granted. He thinks they are at his service. He is another important character who is generally addressed as Piggy. His name is Mr. Wiggins, but people hardly know him by that name. The young girls who work for him hardly remember his original name and they enjoy calling him as Piggy. Piggy has received a name that aptly describes his character. Moreover, O. Henry writes a brief paragraph that directly describes his nefarious activities. Piggy is a stalker. He hangs around establishments where underpaid girls are working. His practiced eye can detect at a glance and tell how long it has been since they enjoyed their last meal. And he takes advantage of this talent of his. Then he picks out someone who looks especially hungry and treats her to a hearty meal. His motives are not altruistic. Moreover, O. Henry describes him with the words, he was fat, 
He had the soul of a rat, the habits of a bat, and the magnanimity of a cat. Though these words are used to show some alliteration that aptly describe the character of Mr. Wiggins, who is otherwise called Piggy. Now, after finishing this brief effective paragraph about Piggy, O. Henry contemptuously dismisses him and practically ignores him for the rest of the story, and he concentrates on how these rich men, they take undue advantage of the poor girls who work for them. An unfinished story has a simple theme and it is a clear indication that it is nothing less but a satire. It is a satire by O. Henry which he is very well known for. He spends very little time describing the objects of his satire. He has presented it very cleverly. He uses an indirect approach and leaves much to the imagination of the reader. As discussed earlier, he never closes the story, he never finishes the story, but rather he leaves it to the imagination of the reader. So even the satire is not projected directly, but it is presented through an indirect approach. It's chiefly directed at two targets. The satire is aimed at two targets, as we see in the story, a man named Piggy, that is his nickname, his actual name was Mr. Wiggins, but he is nicknamed Piggy, and a class of businessmen who hire girls to work for them for a very less rate of $6 per week. Definitely this is a less amount and they want to take undue advantage of their poverty. Generally, a satirist would make one of the businessmen a character in his story employing a copious amount of irony in describing him, perhaps even giving him a name that aptly describes his character. But instead, O. Henry allows them to remain a faceless class of people. He demonstrates their villainy by showing how one of the underpaid employees fares in her life. He makes Dulcie the main character and through her he tries to mock at the behavior of these rich businessmen. Even as a faceless class, O. Henry says surprisingly little about them throughout the story. Even at the very end, when a satiric bomb explodes in their faceless face, the satire does not directly describe their activities. He says, my activities are less heinous than theirs. He just leaves it there for the readers to understand, for the readers to imagine the further story. The period in which the story was set up is also very important for us to understand in its true sense. O. Henry wrote the story in the early 20th century and at that time six dollars a week went much farther than it would have been in the present day. But definitely even in those days, $6 a week was not an amount that was really sufficient for anybody to lead a happy life. It was just sufficient for them to keep their body and soul together with great difficulty. That is the reason why these girls are said to be experiencing poverty because $6 per week would hardly give them any amount to spend or even to save further. And as we observe, Piggy, who was a stalker, he took undue advantage of their poverty. The girls who had very less income for the week and they had their high aspirations. To fulfill their dreams, they had to submit themselves to the evil actions of Piggy. That's what we observe because Piggy, who had a detective eye, who could easily detect at a glance how long it has been since the girls had enjoyed their last meal. And then he picks out someone who looks especially hungry, terribly hungry and in need of. And he tries to treat her with a hearty meal and make her happy and then make use of her poverty for his selfish motives. O. Henry 
believed that when the girls decided to call him Piggy, they were heaping unnecessary denigration on the noble race of swine. This is a mockery, a satire which is presented in a subtle manner where he says even the race of swine would feel as an insult if we called him Piggy. That means his character was even worse than a swine. The tone of satire is seen throughout the story and in presenting the characters. The very fact that he describes the character of Piggy as he was fat, he had the soul of a rat, the habits of a bat and the magnanimity of a cat. These tell us that he had these features. He tries to present Piggy's character comparing him with all kinds of animals. While O. Henry does not finish the story, he puts some finishing touches on the businessmen who hire girls for a less amount, like six dollars per week. O. Henry tells us that one night he had a dream, so this all happened in the dream, and he had died, and he and others were about to appear in the celestial court for judgment. Standing nearby were a group of businessmen who, during their lifetime, had hired girls to work for six dollars per week. They were also being judged along with the narrator. A celestial policeman approached O. Henry and asked him if he also belonged to the same group of businessmen. O. Henry was surprised. He was taken aback and he asks. He protested that his activities were more innocent than theirs. He reveals that he does not belong to the group, nor is he willing to associate himself with the group. And he also says in his defense that the only thing which he had been guilty was just setting fire to an orphanage and murdering a blind man for his pennies. So he tries to say that his crime, his offense was nothing when compared to the offense of the other people in the group, that is the rich businessmen whom he is being associated with. Henry is known for his short stories and his writing style is famous throughout the world. He began writing stories as we discussed in the introduction while he was in prison. And he quickly fine-tuned his skills behind the bars and developed into an excellent storyteller. Born as William Sidney Potter, he produced 270 short stories under the pseudonym O. Henry. His stories are superbly outstanding and there is a remarkable style in his writings. An unfinished story, our present short story, is no exception to these features of O. Henry's style of writing. Anybody who reads O. Henry's stories can easily identify his style of writing. Firstly, his brilliant use of language. The stories were written in the first half of the 20th century and O. Henry's use of language easily surpasses those of the contemporary writers. Not only does he have an extensive vocabulary, but his writing abounds with similes and metaphors that breathe in smartling life and depth into his stories. An unfinished story employs profound metaphors of angelic hosts to tell the tragic story of poor Dulcie's struggle for survival. O. Henry has a great understanding of the trials of the lower class. He empathizes with that class and he frequently pictures the lives of ordinary people of the early 20th century America with warm and sympathetic colors. His characters are generally the frequently overlooked people of the society. The struggling shop girl, the unsuccessful artist, the impoverished. Admittedly, some of his images can be hard to comprehend for modern readers and the distance that the time has placed between us and O. Henry's beloved New York means that some of his verbal pictures will be hardly able to understand and identify with 
for the present readers. But his genuine sympathy that he has for the oppressed cannot be missed. We can still understand, comprehend and empathize with those characters even today. The present story is also an example of that kind. This is reflected towards the end of the story when the narrator says that the crime is not very big when compared to those committed by the corrupt businessmen. That's how he tries to bring that what he has done was much less when compared to those committed by the businessmen. Thirdly, he is known for his warm humor. O. Henry has an uncanny ability to portray the mundane and the ordinary in the most elevated language. Frequently, he puts two characters together in a remarkable way so that one outshines and complements the other. And on other occasions, he crafts the most ingenious and humorous schemes for outwitting others. The humor aspect in the story is when he says that it would be humiliating the swine if Mr. Wiggins was called Piggy. Fourthly, and most importantly, his ironic twist. One of the distinctive characteristics of O. Henry's short stories is the ironic twist at the end, which never fails to surprise and entertain, sometimes reversing the entire storyline in a concluding one-liner. That is what is O. Henry's stories are known for, the twist towards the end. O. Henry's suspense and trademark ironic twist ensures that readers who have a good literary taste in short stories will not be disappointed. Though there is no significant twist towards the end in the present story, the story is left unfinished to the imagination of the reader, which is not generally done in any short story. There is a conclusion to the story, whereas here it is left to the imagination of the reader. He suggests that Dulcie might have gone out with Piggy at some other time in future. Maybe she was more hungry and at that time of being hungrier, she might have gone out. But it's not clearly indicated whether she has really gone out with Piggy or she could resist going out with him forever. O. Henry's narrative poses important questions about which ideological assumptions are being dislocated in the progressive era. In a world where long-standing principles are being put to the test. To yield to new patterns of conduct and changing identities, the most visible symptom of this disruption of values is the disbelief in a pre-established set of rules. While O. Henry does not finish the story, he puts some finishing touches on the businessmen who hire girls for $6 a week. He tells us, that in the dream he had seen on the day of judgment, the celestial cop, the policeman, asking him if he belonged to the group. Now, interestingly, there is another character, General Kitchener, who is not actually a character, but he is a man in the photo frame. Dulcie talks to the photo frame often because it is placed just under her mirror stand, and she personifies the photo frame. She talks to him as if he is there alive, standing in front of her and talking to her. Though it is just a photograph in the frame, she personifies, she tries to talk to him. She even offers him while eating the raspberry jam and crackers for dinner. And she also reveals that it is because of him, the look that he gave at her stopped her from going. So, O. Henry, towards the end, leaves the story saying that maybe when General Kitchener was not strong enough to stop Dulcie from going, she might have gone. So, this character of General Kitchener, who is not present in the story as a real character, but 
influences the character of Dalsi through his presence in the photo frame is also important for us to understand the mindset of Dalsi, how it works. It is her inner voice that speaks, but to say that it is her inner voice, she presents it in the form of a character which is in the photo frame. She also imagines that if General Kitchener were alive here and would sometime come to her, she would have been very happy. But at the same time, she also realizes that since he is not here, it's not right on her part to imagine him to come. And she realizes the truth that he's just a photograph in a photo frame and she can never expect him to come for her. That is how O. Henry tries to present the situations, the social setup of the 20th century New York. And he also tries to mock at the corrupt businessmen during that period. And he empathizes with the little girl, Dalsi, who had worked for $6 a week. And to overcome her poverty, she tried to resist her outing with Piggy, but at the same time might have gone out at some other time. The story is left unfinished as the title aptly suggests, an unfinished story. So it is left to the reader to decide that his acts were not as heinous as those of others in the group, and thus the story is left unfinished as the title aptly suggests, an unfinished story. So the story is left unfinished. Hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you.